We only got two more things to cover, and and there there there's hardly anything to do with these because what we did with the uh, with the particle motion, we only have to add to a little tiny bit, and then we can keep going with it. Uh, so today we wrap up our uh, work on the work energy equation. We only have a little bit to add to it, a little tiny thing here. Bob, you're looking forward to that? Yeah. You don't like the work energy equation? No, I like it. It's so easy to use. You just, it's, it's just an accounting problem. If you remember what it was, we had uh, four terms in it. The work, remember, is that done by outside forces. We can add a little bit to that just with the, uh, the stuff we've done now that we've been working on some rigid bodies. That will take uh, uh, two things now. The first thing we've always had, the fact that work can be done by a force moving through a distance in the same direction as that force. And remember, that's what the dot product does for us. It throws out the part that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, keeps the part that's parallel to the direction of motion, even accounts for the fact that uh, those could be in opposite directions as would be for braking forces. Uh, by the way, this is, of course, the net force on the object. But you can do it uh, you can do that calculation for the individual forces and add them together, or you can add the forces together and then do this for the resultant, and you'll get exactly the same answer. So, so those, for those so inclined, it's a very flexible uh, method, as I think is so much of the rest of the, the work energy method, because you can do it, you can put all the disparate parts together however you wish. Uh, the only part we can add to it now is the fact that we can have objects that are having work done to them uh, during rotation. And so that might be something like, well, if we, if we had some object and we applied, uh, say, a couple to it that would cause it to rotate, then that couple would do work. Oh, I don't want to change colors, not yet. That couple would do work by moving uh, an object through a rotational distance, which would then be d theta. So it's still very much like, uh, like the linear um, work energy term, uh, work terms, right? Um, in that uh, it's still the, the uh, the force doing the turning, which would be a couple or even a, a, a moment if we have one. Let's put that in just in case. Oh, and by the way, this is also the net couple or moment um, times the distance, angular distance. And this too is actually a dot product. But for our two-dimensional problems, it's just uh, simply the couple times the direction in which it moves. Uh, including the possibility here that uh, those two might be in opposite directions of each other. The couple could be acting one way um, and the displacement, angular displacement, if any, acting the other. So that's, that's just a, a possible small addition that we might have in a problem. No great worries, I hope. We'll, we'll uh, treat them when we get to them. The only other term that has any real change to it is the uh, kinetic energy term because this will now involve a possibility that there's a change in translational kinetic energy and or a change in rotational kinetic energy. Might have both, might have one or the other, uh, might have neither in some problems. So it just depends on all the problems. But again, it's, it's very flexible. If you have a couple things translating, you can calculate the kinetic energy for them individually and just add them all up together. You can do the same thing for rotational things. Uh, the only difference is um, we do have the possibility that an object is in pure rotation. 
So we uh, might know where its center of gravity is, but it happens to be rotating about some other point A. This is a, a condition of, of pure rotation. When we have this kind of thing, it, it uh, is a little bit different in that not only do we have the translational motion because the center of uh, mass is moving, but we have the fact that we have mass rotating and uh, its distribution with respect to that point A also plays a factor in this. But it's not a terribly big deal to handle. We uh, we look at it like this. So uh, we know that the change in translational. Uh, well, there might be a little bit simpler way to do this. Let me do it this way. I'll do just the kinetic energy itself, and then you can do it for two different points and get the change in kinetic energy. It'll just make the algebra up on the board a little bit simpler. Uh, because it's the same whether it's the T2 or the T1 we're talking about. Uh, so there's no sense putting both of them up there when we've got a couple things going. So the translational kinetic energy would be our typical one-half mv squared type term because the center of gravity itself has some uh, linear velocity. But then there's also a rotational component to this, this solid that uh, we'd also have to take into account. So we, we could use our straightforward uh, uh, rotational kinetic energy term and uh, would do it exactly like that. But if we work with that a little bit, uh, remember our kinetic, our, sorry, our kinematics relation that the velocity of the center of gravity has to do with how far away it is from that center and how fast it's rotating. So we can take out Vg and put in omega d uh, in its place. That gives us both terms with just the angular velocity in it. So we don't have to actually figure out the velocity of the center of uh, mass if we don't want to, if we're just looking for the angular velocity or if we just have that, that's all we need to use. But we can rework this a little bit. Let's see, one half is a common term to both. Then uh, omega squared is also a co common term to both. So I'll take the one half out the front and the omega squared out the back. Yeah, that looks right. Uh, what's that term in parentheses? Should look familiar. Parallel axis theorem. That's the parallel axis theorem giving us the moment of inertia with respect to that point of rotation, point A which then gives us a second option. If we have that moment of inertia, we can calculate the kinetic energy by just using that. If the object is in pure rotation, this is uh, only if that point A is stationary, at least for that instant. Um, if you think back, though, we had the, uh, the method of determining what the, what the instantaneous center of zero velocity was and then using that for calculations. If we happen to have or can find the moment of inertia with respect to the instantaneous center, we could do the calculation from there. Also, though, remember that uh, when an object was rotating without slipping, the contact point at the bottom was a point that was not moving at that instant. It's an, also a point of instantaneous zero velocity. So if you have an object that's rolling, you have to know its moment of inertia with respect to that point. You can then uh, use just that much simpler term. But either one of these 
will work. It's not that it's they're exclusive of each other. They're just this different forms of the very same thing. And it just kind of depends on what you need and or what you have in a problem as to which is the easier to use. Use the easier. That's what I do because I'm professionally lazy. Then the other two terms don't change. They're still just as, as they were. Um, just have to be careful. If an object is rotating like this, then its center of gravity is changing height, and there will be a gravitational potential energy term with just that <coughs> rotation um, if it doesn't go an entire complete rotation, giving it no change in height. So the other two terms, exactly the same, no change, no sweat, we're ready to go. Okay, so a little problem here, kind of like a kind of like a garage door problem. We've got uh, a slider constrained to sliding in the horizontal direction, and some kind of link connecting that to another slider. constrained to slide in yet another direction, perpendicular to the first. Clean things up there so it looks beautiful. Ah, now it does. Where we'll take this arm, this uh, bit of link arm here, to be uniform and slender, just like me. Uh, 0.4 meters long, 10 kilogram mass, and then uh, you know if you if you uh, take a look at your garage door, you it's it's got uh, usually a spring on it to assist with the closing. So we'll put one there, um, such that the uh, Spring constant is 800 newtons per meter, and it's unstretched. When the door is open, when this angle here is zero, so the door's all the way up. That way, it's easiest to reach up, pull the thing down that stretches the spring, then uh, uh, it'll kind of hold in place, and then when you want to open it, it's a little easier to get it going, it goes up to the top. So we want to find the angular velocity of the uh, door itself, and then of course then if we wanted to, we could find the speed of one, the one end coming up uh, if we needed right after that. Uh, but find the angular velocity when at rest at uh, theta equals 30 degrees. So partly open, given a little bit of a push or something, uh, just how fast is it moving then? when it gets to the fully open position. Of course, you'd want to make sure that it doesn't slam up there and break the windows. Well, you guys, since you're trying to sneak in from being out too late at night, you don't want the door to make a big clanging noise when you open it and wake up your parents and they come running downstairs and, and you're grounded for two weeks. Uh, I have a question about this. <laughs> You don't worry about being grounded for two weeks? Yeah. Eric? What can I get in trouble for? Yeah. Bobby? You could probably get him in trouble there. Go <laughs> hang out with Bobby for a while. <laughs> What's your question? Well, um, if it's if this thing is closing, so theta is becoming smaller, I guess. I, I'm What's becoming smaller? Theta, I'm thinking. This is supposed yeah. to be a door in this. Yeah, we're, we're, we're we want to find out what the what the uh, 
Oh, sorry. Find sorry. omega when when theta equals zero when it rests at 30 degrees. Okay. Was that your question, or was there still another one? Oh, so you're saying it begins at 30 degrees. Yeah, starts at, right. starts so at about where it is here at rest. All right. Then it's, it's allowed so it allows it to start to close. Remember that fine angle of velocity at 30 degrees, yeah. but I don't know what angle is set at. Yeah, you should have said, uh, you should have said it's zero and then left early for the day. <laughs> but I would have called your parents and grounded you for two weeks. All right. Remember, uh, work energy problems work real well when springs are involved, when gravitational position changes involved, when general position changes are involved. So uh, let's start with that. Again, I recommend, though hardly anybody ever listens, keep it in its little compartment so it's a bunch of small problems. You don't screw up the minus signs, don't screw up the units. Things just seem a, a lot simpler if you do so. Any of those zero. So the problem just starts getting smaller right from the beginning. Sorry, I think it's just the first term. The work term? Yeah. Remember what goes in there is any outside forces, any non-conservative forces. Remember what conservative forces are? Yeah, these are two conservative forces, the spring and the gravity, because if we return to the original position, there's no difference in, in the action of those things. Everything returns to exactly like it was before. That's not true with any other terms. If, we, if we're going to look at friction in these channels, uh, friction is nothing you can get back no matter how many times you repeat it. Sorry, Professor. I'll run you, but that's the truth of it. So, yeah, that first term is zero. No. No, uh, no forces in there. Uh, there are mortarized garage doors. We'd have to take that into account if we had one, but uh, we're, we're keeping the problem. This is an acoustic garage door, so there's no uh, no motor attendant to it. Uh, that arm, I'm not connecting the, the two. That's massless, right? No. 10 kilograms. We, we'll take the sliders as oh, massless. So Oh, okay, before we used to, like, I see something like that and be like, oh, I can't use work energy on that. You better. It's already on the board, eh? We're committed. We're committed to the work energy pro problem. We're halfway through it. We're on the second term already. All right. Um, T2 minus T1. Any of those zero? T1, of course, uh, starts at rest down at the 30 degrees, so that one's zero. But uh, the T2, then, remember, is uh, very much like the thing we just looked at, where the center of gravity will have some contribution to the angular, uh, uh, some contribution to the kinetic energy change, but so will the fact that this isn't a massless arm and it itself is going through a, a change. So you might want to do uh, however you prefer to do this, split that T2 into the translational part and the rotational part. That would be one half mv squared plus one half i g omega squared, where that omega there is the thing we're looking for because that's omega two since that's t two. So I can put a little t on, or a little two on both of those. And then we can we can work out that term. Uh, if you want. However, you might recognize the, that uh, when theta does equal zero, when we're looking for this last little moment, uh, as, it, as it finally reaches the horizontal position, 
what's the velocity of this point? Let's call it point A, that's slider A. It's a slider B. What's the velocity of slider A at the instant when the piece reaches the top? It'll be zero. It'll be zero. So we can use, well, we don't have the picture up there anymore, but uh, at the instant, put it here at, at, uh, at theta equals zero, our point of interest, then VA equals zero. And we can thus say uh, we have the possibility of using that as our kinetic energy term. If we know the moment of inertia or can find it about point A with respect to point A, do we? You're grounded. That's three weeks now, Buster. Do we know the moment of inertia of the object we're talking about in motion about point A, with respect to point A. And since we're considering the sliders as massless, we're talking about the little arm here, do we know its moment of inertia about point A? We do, it's one of the things in the, in the book, or some of you might even remember it offhand. It's one-third ml squared where L is the length of the slender rod, and its mass, of course. Uh, if we do it about the center, it's 1 12th, and if you take 1 12th ml squared plus uh, md squared, where d is half of L, you end up with, uh, <coughs> with exactly that anyway. Well, we've got M, we've got L, uh, that simplifies this term, this whole, remember this is the change in kinetic energy term, because T1 for all objects was zero. So this all is just based on whatever happens at point. Oh, what about the fact that before it reaches theta equals zero, point A is moving. Does that negate all of this stuff where I said, uh, was, well, since point A is not moving at that instant, we can do this as a, as a simple rotation about that point. Because before that is rotating, before that point A is moving, remember, making the jump from here to here depended on point A not moving. So can we do this? Friday, the second to last week of school. Can we do that, Colin? Jay? You have to commit. What? You have to commit. You have to stand up. You have to take a stand here. Bobby? Nope. No stand there. Alex? I'm saying, yeah, we definitely have to know you say this VA only holds when theta equals zero. Before that, that's not true. Can we make the jump from here to here, which depended upon A not moving? Yeah. Jake says, yeah. I say yes. Yeah. Doobie says, yeah. Frank? Sure. Just because it's already up there, you kind of feel like, but I can erase it. And even though I hardly ever make mistakes at the board. Pat? Sure. Yeah, of course we can. Remember, this is only dependent upon what's going on at point two, not between what's going on between one and two. All we care about is the instant of point two of our concern, what's happening, and at that instant, velocity is not moving, so we can make this uh, step right here. And we've got all those pieces, so that's a really easy number to calculate. Because um, yeah, we have we have the mass, the length, and everything else comes out to be uh, 0.267 omega two squared, and the units will be newton meters 
if omega-2 is in the usual range per second. So we know whatever number we come up with, it's got to be that. All right, uh, you can do the spring term because that has nothing to do with this rotational stuff. You can also do the kinetic energy term. So let me uh, let me collect while you're doing that. I'll collect our our on our evolving work energy term. You know the change in kinetic energy will be. Uh, 0.267 omega 2 squared. So you do the change in kinetic energy terms, uh, sorry, the change of potential energy terms, and we'll see if we agree, and then put the whole thing together for the quick solution. I think I could go uh, some sort of. Let's 
six years. What? Six years. There's, there's no sense going beyond either one of these two things and before you check with anybody, because if, you if you're wrong on those, you go beyond it, you're just doing the wrong problem. And when you use the height for the potential energy, do you do it from the G to the top? Ooh, good question. For the height, for the potential energy term. We only have, well, we have two things changing height. The slider is two, but remember we're treating that as massless. Uh, it, it's mass is inconsequential compared to everything else. So what do you use for delta H for the height here? I think it would be like half the length of that bar times the sine of that angle. It, it is indeed the change in height of the center of gravity. which is just like you said, uh, half the length times half the length times the uh, 30 degrees, sine 30 degrees, which is, which is what, 0 0.1? 0 0.1 meters, and, so, and it's positive. And we'll give you units of uh, Newton meters right there as it should. This is not an aerial view of the door. Side view. There. I just turned your earth 90 degrees. Which is amazing because you didn't slip out of your chair which was great last week. I really appreciate that. I'm still thinking about that. that. was such an awesome move. Right? Is that what you got? Bobby, that makes sense then? Can, can anybody do this in their head? I mean, went to the calculator for that count. For that. 10 times 0.1. Why more than that? 9.1. And the units are newton meters, so that's our delta V G term. Um, delta T, delta V G. We have one last term to put in. Do you get it? Everybody agree with it? Is it? Uh, let's see. V E two minus VE1. Which, are either of those zero? Is, is the spring ever at a zero energy condition? Which means it's uh, completely unstretched or uncompressed. At unstretched, when theta equals zero, which is our final position? So VE2 is zero. If you didn't actually do that, you might have missed the minus sign. Did anybody? One half k del squared, uh, sorry, del one squared minus one half k del one squared. What's k? 800 newtons per meters. And del 1, the amount of stretch in the um, spring at, at the initial point. Not its complete uh, total length, which we don't know anyway. Because we only know where it's unstretched. We don't know its total length. And so that would be like 0.4 times sine 30. Oh, point four times. No, is that right? Oh, the square. Yeah, I know I was missing something. I completely forgot about that square. You're only going to forget or miss. You might miss the minus sign here if you're not careful with this, and uh, it's, it is quite common to miss the square. 
that's minus 16 newton meters. That's the same thing you got, everybody? Did you have minus 16? And so now you've got a very simple equation. We can just call some dope down there and the help come to solve this now. Almost anybody who walks by can do it. And you got. Huh? 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 Bobby, you get no extra credit for comments, snide comments that I don't actually hear. Uh, clockwise or counterclockwise? Of course, counterclockwise. So however you want to designate that. All right. Hopefully fairly straightforward. Um, again, remember the easiest, two easiest things to do is miss this minus sign and just then forget to square, which is just an operational thing. But if you miss this minus sign, you're doing a completely different problem. And I, I don't think your bosses are happy when you do a completely different problem. Huh? All right, any questions before we clean up? Do another one. Okay, Frank, again, this is a side view, not top view, so get ready. Are you serious this early? You can get out of class anytime you want. Get up and go. Frank can't, because I can catch him. You got it. <laughs> you heard that one. I heard that one. All right. Uh, we've got a, a hinged bar here. Not quite to scale, a little too difficult to draw that. Pinned at the bottom, free hinge there. Uh, it's two meters long, and at the midpoint, attach a spring. And up, up here at the top, we have a, a mass of uh, a radius that's not significantly big compared to the length of the the entire rod itself. So we'll just take that as a concentrated mass. So some of the other details then. Rod's two meters long. The mass up there is four kilograms. The rod is nine. The distance from the wall is a tenth of a meter. Again, a uniform slender rod, two meters long. There's an initial angular velocity of three radians per second. Spring K, what else? Okay, spring uh, Yeah, I think this initial spring what's that like? Oh the the initial spring length is uh, a quarter of a meter. Yeah, that's right there it is. Okay, so that's the setup. That's the initial situation. At that instant, this has an angular velocity uh, in that direction. I thought I'm not, I'll not usually 
represent the breast length of this It does. That's exactly what it is. Oh, so it's initial? It's initially compressed a little bit. It's, it's rest length is out here somewhere. We attached it, pushed the bar to the wall to compress the spring oh, initially. That was the uh, compressed length for a second. I was like, oh. No, that, that's the compressed length. That's, the peak. that's, oh, that's how long it is right now. So L1 is this 0.1 meters. And remember that del is the difference in those. Del1 will be L1 minus LO, which of course we're going to need for the, the potential energy term on there. So the deal is you need to figure out what spring constant will allow this to just come to a stop at horizontal. Find K, so uh, V equals zero at horizontal. Just to make it interesting, we're going to do this on your car roof. So if you don't guess right and it hits your car, it's going to bash in your car roof. You've got a, a, a moon roof. Gonna shatter right through it. What do you drive, Bob? Is it red with a blue moon roof? No, right on you. Darn right, I'm driving. But that's not it. I'm not putting my car under something you guys designed. No way. So if, if the spring's too strong, it's not gonna make it to the bottom. If it's too light, it's gonna hit the bottom with some uh, residual velocity. So find K such as just. Uh, not moving at the bottom there. This, <coughs> Bob, you can make this into a get out of class question if you just go slow enough. You know, if it takes you a full half hour to do this problem, then I'll probably yeah, let you go. <coughs> but you'll feel guilty. You'll feel like your tuition dollars weren't used appropriately. You'll say, why didn't I get everything from Manning I possibly could have when I had the chance? Oh, Jake's thinking about that hammock. Swinging in the hammock, reading your dynamics book. Man, does life get any better? Slender rod is that? Looks like a battleship. Looks, looks like, like a battleship running into the rocket. dock. At first, I thought we were drawing a rocket. That's a rocket. Even Frank's not confused by that drawing, are you, Frank? No, nah, it's a good one. I forgot how to find the center of mass of two particles. So, what's the equation for that? Mx plus. You don't necessarily have to. Treat them separately. Remember, that's the beauty of this. You can calculate each of the parts separately if you want, or you can count, calculate each of the parts uh, collectively. However you want to do this, the, the work energy equation accommodates your individual preferences. Anybody register for fall? What are you going to take? I've taught you everything. That's all that makes it for you. That's all well, that, that's good. So is that an NC2 zero? <coughs> right. I don't think it's going to be for both of you. thinking 
T2 is zero. Yeah, we want it to just come to a rest there. No angular velocity, no linear velocity either. So yeah, that one's zero. Oh, by the way, I assume we already hit that the work term is zero. I hope we're doing no work today. Okay. This is the linear velocity for T1, zero. I don't know if we need to know linear velocity. Well, it depends. Depends on how you handle handle uh, that that concentrated mass thing. That is the uh, uh, term we need to worry about here. Um, you might recognize that this is a situation, one of those situations like we just had, where it's uh, in pure rotation. About we can label that as point A. So. We've got the minus sign. Can we do that? Sorry, omega 1 squared, which is just a given. Uh, one of the things we already know. But can we do that since point A itself is not moving? Well, let's see. Uh, we've got the minus, got the one half. Then I, A, remember when you have a compound body and you need to find the moment of inertia, but you can do the moment of inertia of the two separately. So I guess we can, what we call that, the rod plus the mass. I R, I am. Uh, omega one squared. Um, moment of inertia of the rod about with respect to point A, of course we have that. That's the one-third type of thing we just used. For the rod. Um, and that has in it the, the business of the moment of inertia about uh, uh, a different point other than its center of mass. Um, but what about the uh, what about the what do I call it, the mass itself? We don't have the moment of inertia of a small mass uh, with respect to just some point off in space anywhere in the book. Well, at least I don't think we do. So we'll have to use the parallel axis theorem on it, where M is, of course, the mass itself. Uh, and what is D? Distance between the point A and the mass. The distance the mass is from the point of rotation, or the, the axis we're interested in. So that we've got, that's the two meters. What's the moment of inertia? of the mass. Well, it kind of looks like a sphere. Is that in the book there? The moment of inertia of a sphere? Well, what did I say about the size of it? Didn't I say something? I said its radius was small compared to everything else in the problem. So that means its own moment of inertia is essentially zero. Ah, great. I didn't know that it was supposed to be a sphere. I thought we were treating it as a particle. I feel like it doesn't matter. They're no different. A particle has no moment of inertia. A concentrated mass or a sphere of negligible radius uh, has no moment of inertia, uh, no appreciable moment of inertia about its own center of gravity. So we've got all those terms then. And so. Uh, as long as you remember your square and your minus sign, you should have all the pieces there for that one. And then the, uh, uh, well, we'll need some delta V G term we can put in. We don't need very much space for it on the board. So finding the center of mass, we still work, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. But 
uh, well, you do it. Uh, remember the the location of the center of mass is equal to the position of the individual centers of mass times their mass, uh, where x is the distance of the individual center of mass from whatever point you're interested in, which would be probably a would be the easiest, over total mass. Total mass. So yeah, you could place it, and you wouldn't be surprised, I'm sure, to find it uh, probably somewhere in here. Yeah. I get about like one point three yeah. meters. And when you put that in to here, um, then you pretty much get the same thing. You're still going to have to do the individual moments of inertia. That's right. Um, I guess. Yeah, you, you still have to. There's no way around that. Mg delta H, um, again, that's two things that are doing this, two things going through a change in height. So just do them separately. The rod and the mass are each undergoing a change in height and not the same one. The only thing they share is actually G. what numbers you get for those, those pieces and then we can look at the spring. It takes a little bit more work, but not much. You got all three terms, Frank? Want to check on? Uh, you still have, still have one to your, your 
your elastic energy term is still not correct. Got delta T. Got delta VG, everybody's getting 167 newton meters. Negative 167. Uh, yeah, sorry, negative 167 because it drops. Right, Jake? Anybody, this, we, we've got all, all the pieces in there, so anybody have that delta T term yet? This is the negative 167. Negative 126. So we can make our equation 0 equals, you had what? Uh, For delta T? Negative 126. Yes, that's what I got too. Where is it? Here it is. Again, you got to catch that negative. You got to make the squares. There's a couple, of, several of them in there. We've got the delta V G term in agreement. So that's delta T. That's delta V G. We need to mean the delta V T term. What's the dispute? Wait, why is why is delta T? I got an answer. Why is delta T? Oh, I like, stops with my yeah, never mind. Never mind. You check my um, comes from here, which is why I strongly suggest you make this what seems like a trivial step. So, uh, Bobby, you're asking for uh, delta V E, which remember will have the K term that we're looking for. That's the only unknown in the whole problem, which is good. We only have one equation, work energy equation. You have delta V E? You want me to check? Yeah. Okay. It's Oh, my goodness. Let me see. Yeah, well, once you get delta V, if you're right, K just follows. Delta VE? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, let's let's put that one up. All right, delta VE is one half the K that we're looking for. Del two squared minus del one squared. Neither of which are zero. Is that right? Because initially it's compressed and finally it's at length. So uh, initial del, we have, um, that's going to be what, minus 0.15. Right, that's the amount of squoosh put into the spring to get things started. Then del 2, let's see, that's going to be the spring from here down to the midpoint here. So that, that is going to be L2, the full length of the spring at the finish of the problem. And that itself is um, a triangle of one meter by 1.1 meters. No, it's only to the midpoint. So we have a, a triangle of one meter by 1.1 meters, so the hypotenuse is L2. Every 
everybody agree on that picture? Everybody in agreement on that picture, that triangular picture? So uh, that gives us uh, a del 2 squared of 1.39. Oh, no, no, it's not the 0 0.1 minus, it's the 0.25 minus, so 1.24 squared, is that right? And the original squoosh minus 0.15 meters squared. Um, what about the fact that the angle has completely changed? on the spring. The, the, the direction in which it's pulling is completely different now. Doesn't matter. This is like the kinetic energy term where the direction of the velocity doesn't matter. The direction of the spring doesn't matter. Colin? Something wrong? Do I have something wrong up there? Was that, I was right with the 1.49? And then we take the original length, 0.25, off of that. And so we've got all those terms. Why is it a uh, rest length minus the uh, length it was at? I thought it was back the other way around. Uh, because if, it's, if we do, do it that way, even though it's not important here, but if we do it this way, then compression will give us a negative number. Extension will give us a positive number. This is the only reason for doing it that way. But we square it anyway, so the minus sign doesn't matter. So how did you get the 1.24? That's that's the final length yeah. minus the uh, minus the original length, 0.25. The final length is 1.49 oh. minus the 0.25. I somewhere got one. Wait, I, oh wait, I got a 1.49 and I typed it in wrong. Am I? Okay, fingers. All right, and so that comes a point five, uh, 754. Is it positive? Yes. And then there's our unknown in there too. As long as K has units of uh, Newtons per meter. Finish up the last little bit, and solve for k. So, Bobby, you were, were a little different on that term, but you're okay now. We're yeah. okay. What what went wrong? Uh, I didn't have the right altitude. Okay. Yeah, gotta make yourself a good drawing as as foolproof way as any, I guess. Okay, want to get out of class question? Do you want to get out of class? Wrong answer. We'll stay, do another problem. That was your chance. Answer the question wrong. I have another one if you want it. If not, you can start your weekend. We get bonus, bonus points. Yeah, sure. If you stay and do a little extra work over everybody else, sure you get bonus points. This isn't this isn't like a, a salary job where you get a point paid a net amount, a uh, set amount, no matter how much work you do. This is like a, more like hourly work. This is piece work. I'll pay you for what you do. You up for it? Or? You want to scoot with Bob. Now that Bob's heading out, and we wouldn't mind a ride with him. Because you guys are going to spend the weekend together. I if I, if I don't way. finish it, come back and end it in. Points. What, you think I'll be here? 
You guys all want one? Okay. Who is it? Sure. Sure. You're. 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 Well, I'll give you Bob's points. Okay. I need them. Never You're what? I need them. Oh, okay. I thought you said I'm leaving. All right. Um, this one, uh, the trouble is, though, it's going to be in terms of the variables. You, you guys, you guys all did this. You guys all did this problem anyway. It was one of our, our physics labs where where I had a, a pulley, then with a weight hung from it, and we uh, figured out we the way we did it. We figured out both the moment of inertia of the disc and the bearing torque that was slowing it down so we had to sum the torques. But we did that as a, uh, a, a straight kinetic problem. Sum of the torques equals I alpha. So we'll do this as a uh, work energy problem. All right, so that is of radius R mass MP. This We'll put a B on this math, or you can use lowercase and uppercase if you can make them distinct enough. That'll be a mass MB. And it falls through delta H. So if you remember when we did this in physics one, we had to figure out the tension from the acceleration of the block that you timed. And then you use the tension to figure out the torque and the like. So do this as a work energy problem. You can treat it all as one system and you don't, have to care, you don't care what the tension in the line is because it's interior to the system. And uh, so starting from rest, find the velocity of the block as it hits the bottom. And it'll be in terms of R, MP, MB, delta H, whatever else you want in there. And do it as a work energy problem. Like you use a rotational velocity is just a um, omega. And all starts with yeah. Oh. Well, remember when you have an extra unknown like that, you can use the kinetics equations, and the kinetic equation is that v equals r omega. So if you have omega, you can get rid of it in okay. terms of v b. This uh, starts from rest, right? There's no rotation movement going on. Nope, just it starts from rest, right. just like we did in lab last year. And some of you may want to come back and do it again in the fall. Just give you something to do. If we did it, work energy as separate items, which we could do, then we have to have attention to figure out how much work it does. But then when we add it all together, the two word terms on that would cancel anyway because the tension doesn't matter. Keep it inside the system.
totally just a simple disk. Do we still want to kill Alan? It's just glaring at me. We could do a test on Alex. If you don't sit between her and the board, she isn't actually glaring at you. Here, so it must be in here. I suppose my mind. Is it 
because it's rotating clockwise? Are you saying clockwise would be negative? No, because if, if you say that, then the, we, I could have just drawn it on the other side. It's still the same problem. So I have the delta T term as all positives. So do you, where'd that minus sign come from? Because of the negative delta H. No, no, it's negative. negative for the delta H goes in there with it. So, so if you're writing it that way, which you can, then delta H is always positive. So you use the minus to indicate whether it's oh. down. So now you've got your minus sign. Which is where here? Yeah, uh, no, there's an M. The mass of the block oh, yeah, is equal. Yeah, it's a mass of the mass. Fine. So it's like saying g equals negative nine point eight one. Don't say that. That's what I was pretty much doing with delta h. Right. Yeah. All right. Now do I have it? You do. Ah. Sweet. Bonus points. Couple hundred thousand. Easy. Plus the five from Bob. Can I spend these like at Staples to get more of these? Yeah. I'm, uh, no books. I want to get some of the same ones yeah, that Matt uses. What? I want to use the same ones that Matt uses. These things are awesome. Those notebooks? Yeah. With the stripes on the front? And they all the match? Be, uh, yeah. There were so many lines. I could do my homework. My, my dynamics homework in like 10 pages. Be a record. Because the lines are thinner? That, yeah. The, 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 yeah. Oh, well, they, and the covers. The cover covers are well, right you can them. see, you bought wide ruled. So that's what you got. That's uh, about the line space. That's not my fault. That's, that's my mom's fault. She yes. Well, she's still shopping before you like her in sixth grade. You gotta go do your own shopping. No, I'm an excuse. She works at Staples. So. Oh, I'd, uh, I'd use whatever she's got. I mean, yeah, she she buys everything else for so, me. But for this for this specific item, I have an excuse. Okay. No, uh, yeah, you're just right because it was just that end of it. Oh, um, no, you're missing something too. You're missing something too. A little bit of a lot of it. Yeah, you know, you, Delta H is negative. So right. you need another negative sign under it. No, no. The, uh, yeah, okay. So your Delta H is positive. Then. You're, you're just putting in the magnitude of the Delta H, not its direction as well. Okay, yeah, so that's fine. Is this supposed to be kind of like really something simple? Uh, or is it like a lot of it's fairly simple. Uh, yeah, there's like a lot of math. In the end, the whole bunch of stuff cancels. It's yeah. only got the two masses and delta H and NG.